our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, especially asking thy blessing. We thank you so much for this truth and for this light. This evening, O oh God, I ask that you may cleanse our body and our minds, that the fire of the Holy Spirit may descend on us, that we can understand your truth fully. And also, that may we go and share with our brethren, share with others that do not know this truth, they may, they, they, they may reach salvation also. Help us, O oh God, to be truthful, to be firm, to stand so that we may someday go to heaven and be with you forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask all these things. Amen. Sister Gabi, would you be willing to help me for a moment? I remember you did this in Germany, so you qualify for here. I would like to go through. My, um, I do terrible on my handwriting, and if I recall right, when we did this in Germany, you did fine. <laughs> So if you would er erase these, and we'll put them in nice, neat um, order, and we'll add the ones we left off, and we'll try to build this um, visually for the video presentation and for ourselves. Well, we can work it together. Let's start with the ladder rain. Why don't you erase the ladder rain and put it back on in a more legible fashion? And <clears throat> over here, don't, don't use too much room or we got a lot to go in here before we get done, if you remember Germany. And, and, but the video guy says they got to be nice and big. I got the biggest board possible, but I don't think there's room for all of it, so we have to restrain ourselves a little bit. Over here, this should be the sprinkling. The sprinkling in here. And uh, Roman Catholic principles we have here. Um, but let's put above it a change in Protestantism. Is that okay? Yeah. Is it? It's Is readable it on your video? Yeah. Okay. Ch change of Roman Catholic principles. So let's go back through where we started while she tries to straighten that up. And, um, a change in Protestantism. I think it's right. We would capitalize Protestantism over here, but um, this can be European. Okay. Um, Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic principles accepted. We'll summarize it that way, underneath it. Uh, maybe above it, put escalating crisis. We know that's going on because uh, people are, their temporal prosperity is removed. And uh, you can put, you can erase that m movement going on in darkness and put that in there. Thank you. 
Uh, I just, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, how do we express this? Going on in darkness. Uh, movement for Sunday legislation going on in darkness in a brief summary. How, how do we express this? Uh, going on in darkness. Going on in darkness. We'll know that. Sunday, Sunday movement. Sunday movement in darkness. Now it's okay we're doing this. This may not turn out real well on the video, but this is kind of a school setting, right? This is something we might expect to see in school. Um, financial crisis, let's put it that way, without trying to define it, define it too closely. Leaders, uh, how, po leaders operating on policy. How, instead of principle, how would we express this? Politicians. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very <laughs> politicians. <laughs> but policy men, policy. Policy rather than principle. Policy. Plays principle. Okay, policy. Policy over principle, or any close facsimile. Um, what about uh, economy? Financial crisis right here. Um, the, the uh, what, what is testimonies for? Agencies of evil combining. Yeah, they're all, that's right. Um, the way marks, we're just understanding the way marks and their bearings. Bearings is that they all have an influence on each other. They're all have a connection. That's how I understand it, at least. Uh, are we forgetting anything that we've dealt with in terms of so far? Um, oh, uh, false revival. False revival. Okay. Financial crisis. That's that's we're using that under the umbrella. Are we missing anything that we've talked about so far? Okay, thank you. That's more legible. Unless you want to redo national ruin down here, mine. What do we have? Policy over principle. Too late. We'd have to erase too much. Um, yeah, we did identify that. I think we'd touch on it more, but you could put you could put loud cry up here. So it's up there. We haven't, we haven't actually identified a text for Michael standing up either, but uh, we have been referring to it. All right. Thank you. The next thing that we'll deal with in the purification of God's church is the speaking. Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Uh, for me, it's very important to be specific about what speaking is in Bible prophecy. Uh, you see that underneath it in, in the Great Controversy 442. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. Um, the United States speaking as a dragon here in verse 11 is not the only place um, in Scripture where a power in Bible prophecy speaks. Where else does a power in Bible prophecy speak? Pardon me? Okay, that, I, I, that, that's true. It qualifies, but that, that isn't a specific statement that I'm looking for. Pardon? 
Daniel 7.25. Does anyone have Daniel 7.25 to read for us? Where's another power that speaks in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7.25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. How did the papacy here in verse 25 speak great words against the Most High? Well, according to Great Controversy 442, it was a legislative action. Were there anything uh, legislatively that the papacy produced during the Dark Ages against the Most High? Yes, all, all the papal bulls that were going out that were used to destroy between 50 and 100 million people were sustained upon papal legislation. The speaking of a power in Bible prophecy is the action of its legislative and judicial branches. And for those of you that are Seventh-day Adventists here in the United States, if you receive uh, mail outs from as many of the self-supporting ministries as I do, then you've probably seen from time to time that some of the self-supporting ministries teach that in the middle of the night, I can remember it even with Bill Clinton, in the middle of the night, Bill Clinton is going to use an executive order to pass a Sunday law. <clears throat> it's not going to happen. Based on inspiration, the speaking of the nation is the action of the legislative and judicial authorities, and the President of the United States does have the power to write an executive order, but it's an executive order. He's the executive branch, and the Sunday law comes through the legislative and judicial branches. And when the United States speaks as a dragon, there's at least two things that happen. And when does the United States speak as a dragon? It speaks as a dragon at the Sunday Law. And what Sunday Law are we speaking about? The Sunday Law that's twofold. Forces you to observe Sunday. And the second part is? Persecutes you for keeping Sabbath. When the United States passes a law with those two characteristics, it will have spoken and it will have done it through its legislative and judicial authorities. And at that, at that time, prophetically, two things take place that we need to understand as Seventh-day Adventists that are very closely related, but they're distinctly different. And one of the things is that the image of the beast in the United States has been fully formed, and I'm emphasizing here fully formed. Um, another way that I express it myself sometimes is that it's reached maturity, what I'm trying to state is that the image of the beast has reached maturity, completed its growth prophetically at the Sunday Law. The Sunday Law is the mark that says uh, all the advance work that goes on in building the image of the beast is, is marked in prophecy at the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast and the image of the beast are two uh, different issues closely related, but the image of the beast is telling a prophetic story um, about a process. Some, some prophecies in the Bible are describing a process. Some prophecies in the Bible are describing a point in time. The papacy received its deadly wound. Uh, there is a process connected to it, but when we think of the, when we s discuss the papacy receiving the deadly wound, usually what pops in our mind is 1798, a point in time. It's it's, it's a, a prophetic marker of a, a single event. I'm not denying there was much behind that single event. But sometimes prophecies are uh, describing a process. I think there's a better way to, to, to make this point, perhaps. If I say the year 330, what does that mean? It's over on that chart, by the way, if you're not familiar with 330. If I say 330... No, Constantine didn't pass the Sunday Law in 330. Close. <laughs> when pagan Rome, Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to Constantinople. The year 330 is a single event. It's, a, it's an event, uh, a prophetic event based on Revelation 13.2. Because in Revelation 13.2 it says the dragon gave three things to the papacy. Pagan Rome gave three things to the papacy, and pagan Rome removed three things for the papacy. It gave three things to the papacy, it removed three things for the papacy in order for the papacy to be established upon the throne of the earth. What were the three things that the papacy removed from, for pagan Rome to take control of the world? 
the three horns, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. But the three things that the papacy gave to, the pa that pagan Rome gave to the papacy was its power, its seat, and its authority. It gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330, a, a, a singular prophetic event. Uh, it gave its power to the papacy when? I've heard 533, 508, they're both important dates, but n not quite there. How about another guess? 496. 496. 496. Why, why do we say 496 is when the pagan Rome gave its power to the papacy? Because, based on Daniel 7, there would be seven European kings that come to the aid of the papacy to remove the three horns of the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And in the process of giving their military support over to the papacy, they also came, gave a, created a connection between their civil power and the papacy. Combination of church and state. And it was a process that began in the year 496 when Clovis, the king of France, was the first of those seven European kings to bow to Rome, bring his civil government together with the papacy, and dedicate his armies to removing the three horns. Now, the other six European nations that were going to do the same, they didn't do it in 496, but they did it one after another. And when did the seventh of those seven European kings finally bow to Rome, give its civil government into the hands of the papacy, give its armies to the papacy, and all of them, by the way, another important point in this process, they also changed the legal profession of religion in their nations from paganism to Catholicism in this process. When did the last of those seven European kings do that? 508. Who was it? Who was it? You guys in the front row. Who was the last of the seven? Pardon me? England. That's what, that's what we call it the United States. England was the last. But in Revelation 13.2, Pagan Rome gave three things to the papacy, power, seat, and authority. And the seat, when it gave its seat of authority, the city of Rome to the papacy, it was the year 330. It was a singular event. But the, the, the giving of the power to the papacy was a process over time. And some prophecies are more of a singular event, and other prophecies are more of a process. The image of the beast is a process. The image of the beast has already begun. The image of the beast is the combination of church and state. And it begins back here, this side of the Sunday law. It requires a change in Protestantism. They have to change. It's a process. They have to adopt Catholic principles. They've done that. They probably are going to adopt some more. But there's a, there's a change that goes on. And, and this change is going on in darkness, even though we can see some of it in the open. Some of it's going on behind the scenes. But it reaches its complete fulfillment when the United States speaks as a dragon. We're going to look at a quote or two here on that subject. But at the same time, a prophetic symbol that is more of a singular type of prophecy takes place. And that we call the mark of the beast. It's identifying the mark of Rome's authority. They both are fulfilled at the identical time when the United States speaks as a dragon, but they are distinctly different but closely related. So, in Great Controversy 445, the image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Sister White here is being clear that there's a distinction between the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. Great Controversy, 448. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of the Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy, of the beast. Those who, understanding the claims of the fourth commandment, choose to observe the false instead of the true Sabbath, are thereby by paying homage. Homage, homage. We're going to deal with homage. Anyone know off the top of their head the, you know, a very distinct definition of homage? I mean... Yeah. 
Uh, maybe I'll save it for later. It's close, but it's, it's an it's a old uh, European word. It's an old European word. The Europeans in here ought to know this. It's a, it was actually, it's a word from an action that would take place um, in the old European times. We'll deal with that later. They are paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. But in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by a secular power, what's the action that they're doing? What religious duty is she talking about that's being enforced by a secular power? Sunday keeping. But in the very act of establishing the mark of the beast, that's what she's saying here, but in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by a secular power, the churches would themselves form an image to the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast in his image. At the Sunday law, the image of the beast has reached full maturity. It's a process. And at the Sunday law, the mark of the beast goes forward. And brothers and sisters, it's, from my understanding, it's important to make that distinction. It's important to understand what, what those two things mean prophetically um, as we begin to dissect Bible prophecy. 443, great controversy. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God, and in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish, accomplish her own ends. There, there's a point in here that maybe we all understand, but it's, it's, it's always a, a burden on my heart to try to drive this point home. If you want to symbolize or shrink down, summarize the definition of the image of the beast in real easy turn, terms, it's the combination of church and state. But there's one other factor that has to be noted, and it's in here. It's not simply the combination of church and state. It's the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. It's not with the state in control of the church. It's within the ch when the church controls the state. And this distinction is made in inspiration, and this distinction needs to be recognized. It needs to be recognized. The image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. And Bible prophecy um, bears this out from a lot of different directions that, Lord willing, we're going to see this week. Now, I had a brother come up in between this last meeting and he asked me about a quote. This quote's found in a few places in Inspiration and one of them is in connection with the visions of Anna Phillips. Was it Anna? Yeah, Anna. It just says Anna. Anna's but, but, but I think, oh, anyway, I, we know her name. Her name isn't hidden, Anna. But anyway, it ha this quote has, doesn't have anything to do with her, what, the part we're dealing with. Um, but this quote here comes from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 976. Already preparations are advancing, and movements are in progress, which will result in making an image to the beast. Events will be brought about in the earth's history that will fulfill the predictions of prophecy for this last day, for these last days. Now notice this. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. When does probation close for Seventh-day Adventists? At the Sunday law. But Sister White is saying the image of the beast is formed before the Sunday law. And, and she says more about it. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test the people of God must have before they are sealed. When are God's people sealed? At the Sunday law. I mean, some may argue, no, really we've developed a character for the seal of God prior to the Sunday law, and that's true. But prophetically, the mark and the seal arrive in prophetic history at the Sunday law, and something, there's some kind of test with the image of the beast 
that's a test that we must pass before probation closes and before we're sealed. In fact, Sister White says it's the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. It's not a minor test. It's a big test. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept the spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. The test comes before probation closes. This is the test by which our eternal destiny is decided. This is the test before that we must pass before we were sealed. That I, I typed that. Uh, this is the test before the Sunday Law test. This is the test before the Sunday Law test. Now we've said earlier, we're still not dealing with the three tests of Adventism, but we have said in our second presentation, uh, yeah, second test presentation, that there is three tests for God's people. And what was the first test that we're suggesting is a test for God's people at the end of time? The spirit of prophecy. And we're saying that the third test for Adventists at the end of the world is illustrated, all three tests are illustrated in the Millerite movement. And the Millerites had three tests. And when Sister White talks about those three tests in the Millerite movement, she goes back to the days of Christ and points to that history where there were three tests. The first test in the days of Christ was John the Baptist. Uh, the triumphal entry is the the history she points to to illustrate the midnight cry of the second angel's message. And then she points to the third test of the cross when you look at all the information. And she says those three tests in that time period parallel the first, second, and third angel's message. And we're familiar that after the third angel's message arrives in history on October 22nd, 1844, what happened? The great disappointment. And how is that illustrated by Sister White? The disappointment immediately after the cross. The third test in the Millerite time period is the test where what happens to the virgins? The door closes. This is where the door is shut on the virgins. October 22nd, 1844. So if we're going to use that history of the Millerite time period and bring it to the end of the world and say, well, we should expect to see three tests at the end of the world, we know that it's at the third test where the door closes. And where does the door close? On Adventism at the end of the world. At the Sunday Law. The Sunday Law is the third test. This is where the wise and foolish are going to demonstrate the character that they prepared prior to that time period. And the second test is a test that has to do with the formation of the image of the beast. And we're not dealing with that at this time. What we're dealing with at this time is the purification of God's church to try to lay out the way marks of end time Bible prophecy. And what we'll say here at this point and move on is that before the Sunday law, in connection with all these things, the image of the beast is being formed in the United States. It's being built. It reaches, it reaches its fulfillment, its maturity, its full development when? At the Sunday Law. It's something that goes up. And somehow, some way, it is a test for the people of God that is an important test. At the Sunday Law, when our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday Law, Protestantism will in this act Join hands with popery. Can two walk together except they be agreed? This is where Protestant America officially comes together with the papal power in its practices at the Sunday Law. And they join hands. And the, the joining of hands is not simply something that we want to, want to identify for Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It's broader than that. But when we get into Daniel 11, 40 to 45, understanding what hands symbolize in Bible prophecy is important. And one of the symbols, though, that is used to identify the Sunday law is the joining of hands. Testimonies, volume 6, page 18. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the glo globe will be led to follow her example. First the United States, then the other countries on the globe follow the example. 
Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. That's two testimonies to that. You know where you get a third testimony to that? Revelation 13, Revelation 17, Daniel 11. This is the sequence of the Sunday Law progression in Bible prophecy. Sister White's doing nothing more than echoing uh, the truth that's established in the Bible. First the United States, then the other countries on the globe follow her example. You know, there's an argument in Adventism about what the glorious land is, is in verse 41 of Daniel 11. Some people want to teach that it's a Seventh-day Adventist church. Can't be, can't be. But I'm just telling you the distinction. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why it can't be. It's the United States of America, and there's a lot of reasons why the glorious land in verse 41 of Daniel 11 is the United States of America. But if you take the word glorious, which means in sense of prominence, and uh, you can identify why the United States is prominent in the world for a lot of different reasons, but I want to remind you of one very important one. The focus of end-time Bible prophecy is the United States. This is where it takes place. This is the most prominent country in terms of pro Bible prophecy in the world today. Now, <laughs> It becomes the place of greatest darkness. That, that isn't, uh, Americans don't have any bragging rights about that. But the issue of Bible prophecy begins right here in the United States. In sense of prominence, the United States is the most glorious country prophetically in Bible prophecy, which agrees with Daniel calling it the, the glorious land. We're one um, presentation ahead of where... Um, I thought we would be. I, I'm pretty familiar on how to get through this material, um, but not on PowerPoint. So as I was putting it together, I was unsure how quick we could go, and I've probably been going a little bit faster because of my unfamiliarity with the subject. But let me summarize where we are. Um, we have one more presentation on the, the purification of God's church that we'll open up with tomorrow morning. I'd, I'd just soon not get into it at that point. I'd like to refresh us tomorrow morning with this and bring this to a conclusion and before we move into Daniel 11. Um, but what we've suggested here so far, if I can recap some of it off the top of my head, is that there are certain rules of Bible prophecy that we need to understand if we're going to be students of prophecy and correctly analyze Bible prophecy at the end of the world. Um, in our first couple of presentations, that's what we were looking at. Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. Um, the, each of the ancient prophets were speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which they lived. And if the ancient prophets were speaking about the end of the world, then it means they're all telling the same story. That's the logic of it all, and of course that's what the Bible says. The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. They're going to agree with one another. If the ancient prophets are speaking about the end of the world, then they're all telling the same story. But it doesn't mean that they're telling the complete story of the end of the world. This prophet tells a little piece, a little here, a little there. The work of a student of prophecy is to bring the various uh, prophetic testimonies down to the end of the world and correctly align them. Bible prophecy is identified as being portrayed upon a timeline that leads down to the end of the world. Historical events upon this timeline are what identifies the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. These historical events are called waymarks by Sister White at some point, at some times. It means marks along the way. And she tells us that we need to understand their bearing to one another. These waymarks have a relation to one another. It's not simply enough to know these historical events. We need to know how they impact the event after them and how they were impacted by the events before them. Um, this isn't a, um, a rote learning process that the Lord has set down in prophecy. This is a, a deep and profound subject. These historical events that are sometimes called waymarks are figurative. They prefigure future events. And this is consistent with um, the primary characteristic that's set forth at least in terms of how many times a characteristic is set forth 
in Revelation, in chapter 1, the primary characteristic identified by Christ is that he is the first and the last. Um, I don't think that we have, as God's people, have really come to grips with what that means, but let me give you at least an example of what I'm saying. One of the tests of whether we understand a prophecy in the Bible correctly is do we see in the first and the last of that particular prophecy an agreement? Okay, let me, let me explain what I mean. The 1200, try to explain what I mean. Um, and this question I'm going to ask because you all are probably advanced students, you'll know this question, but I want you to understand when I ask this question in Adventism and to a lot of people now, I mean, not in the tens, but in the hundreds, I virtually never get the answer. And I know some people in here have the answer. <laughs> but what's the starting, what historical event can we use to identify the starting point of the 1260 years of papal rule? Yeah, how, how do we tell somebody that doesn't know the truth of the 1260 years? How do we show them the starting point? The final of the three horns, the Goths, they fled the city of Rome when? March 538. The third horn had been removed. That is the historical event that identifies the beginning of the 1260 year day prophecy. This is the alpha of this prophecy. This is the beginning. This is the first. And I submit to you that because this is one of Jesus' prophecies, that at the end of this prophecy, we should expect to see some type of similarity. So, how do we identify the end of the 1260 years? It's when a Berthier came and did what? Took the Pope captive. So I submit to you this. The starting point of the 1260 years is when a king fled from the city of Rome. And the ending point for the 1260 years is when a king was taken from the city of Rome. Jesus speaks through the first and the last. This is a simple example to try to, to, try to illustrate the theory that I'm trying to throw out here, if it may be unfamiliar, let me give you one more. And I'm using time prophecies. I'm not saying that the first and the last signature by Jesus in his prophecy is restricted to simply time prophecies, but it is easier to illustrate it. This is the 2300 year prophecy. What starts the 2300 year prophecy? The third decree, the third decree. There was three decrees. What ends the 2300 day prophecy? The third message. But now we're waiting for what? The fourth message. And this, this time period here, what is this? This is the time period of Adventism. This is from the third angel's message, October 22nd, 1844. This is when God raised up the Advent people, not to rebuild and restore literal Jerusalem, to, but to rebuild and restore spiritual Jerusalem, correct? That's why Sister White in several places says the work that Nehemiah did back here at the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy symbolized the work that we were to do during this time period. So this these three messages and this fourth message, this is symbolizing the work of modern Israel. And when does this, this work get symbolized? It gets symbolized at the end of the 2300 day prophecy. And how does the 2300 day prophecy begin? With the same story. Only it's the literal rebuilding and restoring of Jerusalem. And both of these works begin on the third decree or the third message and what symbolizes that the work is done? The fourth message. God's people, the 144,000 have been developed. Right? That's the, in a sense, that's the end of the work. What symbolizes the end of the work back here? Who's the symbol, Sister White says, symbolizes the end of the work back here? Who? 
Not Jerome. You're, I, I, maybe, but, but the one I'm thinking of is Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the, one, the, ref, the reformer that the Lord raised up to finish the work. And, but before Nehemiah came and finished the work of rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem, what did he do? He got a decree from the king. Notice, the beginning of this prophecy is illustrating the end of this prophecy. And one of the rules that we're trying to identify at the beginning of this school is that Jesus speaks through the beginning and ending. And why is that important? Because you're going to hear much here about the beginning of Adventism, the Millerite time period, that it's illustrating our day and age. And that illustration is the voice of Christ. So that's some of the rules. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head some of the other rules. One of the other rules is that I believe we need to have a firm belief in the role and purpose of the spirit of prophecy. We dealt with that this morning. In fact, I would go so far to say, and I, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, that the role and purpose of spirit of prophecy is life or death. And I would say that Sister White is the prophet to Laodicea as well as Philadelphia. And then... To reject her is, at, is, is to be our, our destruction. Uh, then we, we laid out, began to lay out some of the issues in the purification of God's church. And uh, how many have put together questions? One, two, three. That's, that's not enough. Which is okay. Well, I, I, I thought it wouldn't be enough. Now, I, know, I don't know what these three questions are. Uh, we're going we're gonna to put them off where we take the questions and answers tomorrow night where we have a few more questions and cancel out the question and answer period here tonight. Um, there's three issues that I, that I know about. There may be others. There's three issues that I'm hearing about in this prophecy school that, that hopefully the Lord's going to help us to work through. One I mentioned last night, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, another one I mentioned today is, uh, is the prophetic message, how to articulate this, I'm not sure, is the prophetic message the message exclusively, or by me emphasizing the role of the prophetic message as I do, am I undermining or opposing the message of Christ's righteousness? Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll have some discussion on that. And then another one that I just recently heard of in the past hour or so is, is radical Islam the deliverer of God's people at the World Sunday Law? Now, I'm not so sure that I'm expressing that position accurately, but there's three issues that are coming into our prophecy school. And brothers and sisters, If my conviction is correct, and this is human now, but I'm under conviction that we're paralleling the time period of the Millerites. Right now, it's happening. And one of the things that took place in the Millerite movement is that people came together with the help of the spirit of prophecy and worked through some misunderstandings that they had together in the spirit of Christ. So for me, I'm not threatened by any of these three issues. Maybe there's going to come up an, an issue before we get done that I'm going to be threatened by, but I'm not threatened by them, and I hope that um, and as I'm expressing them here that I'm not stepping on anybody's toes or alienating anybody. I think this is healthy for what we're doing here this week. This isn't healthy necessarily um, for a Sabbath sermon, but that isn't what we're doing here in this prophecy school. We're, we're trying to, to share a prophetic message and also not be restrained by... Uh, one person's dogmatic opinion. We're willing to hear some things and see if we can't use the tools of Bible prophecy to come into unity on some of these points. So I've had one request. Usually when you get one request, um, there's others that have the same opinion. Um, and I'm not, not too concerned about the video production here. I want to keep this tape, of course, but I know I might be short on time, but uh, the request was that maybe we could break up into some small groups and have a season of prayer, um, you know, corporately, but in small groups. And I'm not opposed to prayer. So why don't we bring this meeting to a close in that fashion? And uh, if 
5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. There's 35 of us, I guess groups of five, 